Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled Psycho Karen tried to kill me inside the neighborhood, crashes my car. I never expected that I would not only have to file a restraining order against someone but also take them to court, however, the past year has surprised me, as it did most of us. A little backstory before we get to the juicy part of this whole ordeal. I lived in a nice, gated community and have enjoyed my career as a school principal. Many people in the community know me and I'd like to think that I have a wonderful relationship with my kids and their parents. I have never in my life been harassed or threatened, until I met the neighbor across the street. She was not new to the community, but she had just moved houses. We lived in a smaller town, so mostly everyone knew each other through mutual friends and whatnot. As soon as the lady across the street moved in, her behavior became more and more erratic and aggressive after she found out I was the principal of the biggest school in town. At first, I thought that it was something personal against me. I would leave for work in the morning, and she would flip me her middle finger. On one of these occasions, she even started yelling profanities at me when I began backing out of my driveway. She had never directly said these things to my face or been aggressive, but her actions spoke very loudly. On another occasion, the next door neighbor, who was a substitute teacher in the school district, had came over to chat with my husband and me. All three of us were sitting on our porch when we saw the lady across the street pacing up and down the sidewalk, with her phone pointed towards us. It had appeared that she was videotaping us, and honestly, I was glad that there was another witness to this behavior. I had not spoken to anyone about her aggressive and strange behavior, because our community is mostly tight-knit, and I did not want to be the one to cause any drama or animosity. However, with my other neighbor present, I learned that I was not the only one. This neighbor had some issues with her as well, after the lady found out she was a substitute teacher. I had seen some kids in her house and playing in the yard several times, and I wondered if she had an issue with a teacher or school staff that led to this behavior that she seemed to have towards teachers, me, school staff, etc. There were many more instances of this weird behavior, such as her videotaping my daughter walking our dog. Or, in another instance, we were sitting inside in our living room, and we saw her walk her dog from across the street to do its business on our lawn. Her behavior was getting more and more weird, and I knew e eventually we would have to do something. This was not okay, and while normally I would have to problem being direct and confront her, there was just something very off-putting about her. Well, turns out that I would have to do something sooner than later, because about a week later, she purposely tried to hit me head on and caused me to crash my car, completely destroying it. Yes, you read that right. I was coming home from running errands on a weekend, and while I was turning onto my street, there was the crazy neighbor coming out of her driveway. However, she did not seem to be following the natural path of the road. As a matter of fact, she was heading towards me. As I realized what was happening, she speeded up and I ended up swerving my car out of instinct. This led to me crashing my car into a streetlight pole on the sidewalk. I was terribly shaken up about the whole thing, and many neighbors came to see what all the commotion was about. By then, she had speeded off and was of course, nowhere to be found. What makes this whole ordeal even worse, is that my son and daughter were playing in the front yard, which means they saw everything. The neighbors called the police officers while my husband tried to calm me down, while comforting our kids at the same time. The whole situation was absolutely chaos, and it was the last straw for me. Upon the police arriving, I had let them know about the previous instances of her behavior. This is not the first time that someone had called the police officers on her. As a matter of fact, I learned that various school staff and school district employees have had several issues with her. One of them being a school bus driver, who had reported her after she threatened to choke him in front of a school bus full of kids. I also learned that in another school, she had been banned after causing a scene in front of teachers and staff which led them to buckle up on security presence on the campus. I ended up filing a restraining order against her, which ended up giving me a major peace of mind. She was not allowed to contact me by any means, nor was she allowed to be 500 feet of my home. Which means that she had to move. Not only that, but she was also ordered not to come within 500 feet of my workplace, which was considered the entire school district. 
Although I never found out why she was so hostile and threatening towards school staff and employees, I was just damn glad she could not come near me or my family. Hopefully, she would never be allowed to. The next story is titled. The fence is wider on the other side. This story is something my mother did when they moved into the home they live in now. Where they moved to was a commercial apartment, condo place with an HOA. To paint the picture this place has large six-house condo buildings that were all the same and standard eight-home apartment buildings. All the rent-to-own condos have a porch area in the back that led to a parking lot. Some of which my mother noticed has fences. My mother handled mostly all of the getting the house ready and dealing with the HOA. She learned pretty quick that you had to get permission to do just about anything here. So after we moved in she sent in a request to put in a privacy fence, like many of the others in the area. With the HOA's approval and guild lines she finds a contractor, which she discovered was an old childhood friend, surprise, and has the fence put in. KHOA. My mom submits the contractor's document stating the kind of fence and color and specs only for her to receive a letter stating her fence needs to be removed due to not meeting HOA standards. Their reasoning, the technical term for the color white of the fence doesn't match what they allow. Best example would be they allow, paper white, but it was labeled eggshell. They stated they would fine my mother for every day the fence stood. My mother attempted to explain that the specific brand only used that white. To get the other white you had use a different, more expensive fence brand. My mother was peeved to say the least, she went as far to take pictures of all the fences hers included and demanded the HOA distinguish which was hers at a monthly meeting. They couldn't but still didn't care, the paperwork didn't match. Thankfully she had a friend in the contractor. She called him back and spoke with him about what the HOA said, and they hatched their plan. My mother and the contractor pull up the fence and the HOA watch as it's taken away in a day. The next day the same fence comes back and gets put in again, this time the paperwork says, paper white. It's been years and my mother still has the same fence, the HOA never said anything farther. Those fees were never paid but it's fine my mom doesn't use the pool anyway. The next story is titled. You're a naval officer, and we will show you the respect you deserve? Yes sir. Hello folks. A while back I was stationed in Pensacola, Florida, as a trainee for learning to be an IT for the Navy. Every morning our class would meet at the end of a long stretch of walkway where we would march as a unit down to our classroom's building. Now this base is primarily manned by enlisted personnel. For the uninitiated we are the lower ranking personnel and when we encounter an officer we are required to render a hand salute. Most officers that set foot on this base know that they are outnumbered 1000 to 1 and as such, tend to avoid the enlisted mob, as not to draw unwanted attention as massive herds of people are forced to stop what they are doing render a salute and greeting, and you have to do the same. Cue our brand new lieutenant. For naming anonymity, and because I like Forrest Gump I'll change his name to LT. Dan. LT. Dan was a dick, and would regularly park his car near where we were forming up, stroll by our formation, and cuss out any of the new folks that didn't notice. One time his exact words were, I am a naval officer, and you will show me the respect I deserve by rendering a hand salute. Swear to God it was like he rehearsed this spiel in the mirror before showing up that morning. What LT. Dan did not know is that us lowly enlisted folks are petty. What he also didn't know is that sometimes on rare days where it was too hot in North Florida to safely march in formation, we would all be allowed to walk ourselves home down the long one half mile stretch. Well one summer day, with maximum humidity and heat so hot you could fry an egg on concrete we all were allowed to walk ourselves back to the barracks. As we are walking in the distance my class sees the all too familiar stride of LT. Dan coming our way. A plan is hatched as we begin spacing ourselves out several meters apart, and marching one by one down towards him. I was one of the middle of the pack folks and I got to see the look on his face as the first salute and polite good afternoon was rendered, followed by another as soon as his arm went down, then another, by the time he got to me he was sweating. He even shouted at us, you don't need to salute. Try as he might though. Our class decided that day that all 20 plus students in my class, and a few others nearby would render him his proper salute during the sweltering one half mile walk down the path. I can't confirm this or not, but apparently he was pretty pissed at the end cussing pretty loudly. His uniform was all stained from sweat. All I know is from that moment on when we saw him park his car, he would get out. Look at our class and walk well around our class out of hand salute range. Gotta love the military. 
The next story is titled. You want me to burn my trash during dangerous days? Sure. I've been dealing with drama with my neighbor for about two years now. For context we basically live in a bunch of mini houses under 1000 SQFT. My neighbor has a really nice fence the previous owner built for her backyard. It's six feet tall with no cracks. To see over this fence you had to stand on your tiptoes on the back porch or be six feet tall. I knew this because when the house was for sale, the fence gate was left open one day and I went to make sure no one broke into the house via back porch door before closing things up. Summer of 2021. My then partner and I worked in the food industry closing the kitchen. We got home around 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. most nights. Obviously it doesn't pay great so we'd often make food from leftover scraps at work and bring them home in takeout boxes. We were basically nocturnal and COVID was at an all-time high for our region. Even Walmart was closed whenever we were awake. We would sleep from 7 a.m. to 3 quarters p.m. usually. As a result we would got every plate delivered to the house to avoid getting COVID or passing it to others as well as get around our weird hours. Essentially due to our job and COVID we had more cardboard than we could throw in our trash can weekly. When I moved in years ago there was a corner of the yard full of brush and a stump. I cleared so we could safely burn there. However we do have trees and grass so it's not quite safe to burn during high winds and burn bans obviously. During the summer I'd stack the cardboard on the fire pit until there was enough to burn. One summer day the stack had been a few feet tall for a day or so. The problem was that our area was having record level dryness and contemplating banning any fires. The first week it was far too windy to burn safely, but no rain. The next, there was a burn ban for the entire week and in counties nearby. Anyways, my neighbor has always had the lovely habit of calling codes on us. She would never say anything to us to inform us she was upset, we'd just get a letter from enforcement. We know it is her because it never happened until she moved in. She's the type to get mad at you for snooping if you sit on your front porch waiting for your Uber. She was not tall. This meant that for some godforsaken reason she had stood on her back porch on her tiptoes to peer over her fence and report the trash pile in my yard that wasn't even visible from her yard. The city sent us a note to fix it within a week. Fed up with her constant reporting us to codes while our mower had been broken, I decided to give her what she asked for. It was about to give us the first rain we had in weeks so this meant it would get all soggy soon. So I had to take care of it now. Letter in hand, I dragged two five-gallon jugs, formerly kitty litter jugs, outside. I filled them with water. Then dragging my hose out to the pit, I thoroughly doused the surrounding grass with water so I was basically standing in water. This was a solitary endeavor and I was fully committed. I then left the hose on and laying in the grass to keep it nice and moist for three feet around the fire pit in case embers fell out. The wind started to pick up so I lit the fire and watched it carefully, spraying water around the lawn to keep everything nice and moist even as water got evaporated by the heat. My neighbor came home and I saw her peering over the fence until it started to seriously rain just as I was done. I'm guessing she would have melted if she got wet. She hasn't called codes on us since and my partner thought it was petty as hell. But, you know, report me for trying to save. The next story is titled. A footpath? What a great idea. This isn't my story but my ex-boss. I work in a hotel, which changed hands a number of years ago. My previous boss before the change of managements had a number of tales of her time in the hotel trade and this was one of her favorites. She had a previous job running a different hotel, which was a fairly modest size when she took over. Whilst there, the management had big plans for expansion. Ex-boss was responsible for getting this done and went about applying for planning permission for the planned extensions. Over the next few years the hotel grew in size, acquiring a swimming pool, spa and numerous guest bedrooms and function rooms with ex-boss exhausting every avenue she could when it came to getting the necessary permissions, ending up with the hotel being several times its original size. Next door to the hotel was a public car park and picnic spot and, once the expansion was complete, she decided to maximize on the location by building a footpath linking the hotel grounds to the car park, enticing picnickers into the hotel bar. The problem was that by this time the council had made it clear that the company weren't going to be granted any more planning permission for any further work of any sort. Knowing this, ex-boss realized it would be futile to even attempt to apply for the necessary permits, so she took a different approach. She contacted the council, 
saying she was concerned for the safety of the hotel clientele as the hotel was situated on a busy main road, which posed a danger to any customers trying to get from the neighboring car park to the hotel. She demanded that the council took action to ensure the safety of the public, financing some way of preventing them from walking along the main road where they ran the risk of a potentially fatal accident. The council replied that this wasn't their responsibility and, if the hotel was really so concerned about the issue they should pay to have a path built themselves. This was exactly what ex-boss was hoping for and, before the council could change their mind she did exactly that building a footpath at the council's request which they would never have let her do if she had asked for permission through the regular channels. The last story is titled, Angry Neighbor and Village Codes. Edit. My village is called a village despite its size because it is incorporated as a village. It's called a village by Wikipedia. It's referee to as, the village of XYZ. I call it a, small town, because it is outside of the top 150 cities, towns by population in my state. Background. I grew up in a very white bread village, town of about 15k outside of a small city of 110k in middle America. This came with all the petty little problems that come with small town Midwest life. My twin brother and I would hang out around our best friend's house, and their neighbors loved to stir the pot and cause problems. I have two specific instances of MC with them, specifically the wife, Mrs. Nelson. I don't really blame her for being an angry person tbh. I probably would be too if I had to raise four kids while working and trying to go back to school. I digress. The summer before seventh grade, my best friend's family decided to put up one of those three to four feet tall inflatable pools. Our town has a code where any yard containing a pool must be completely enclosed in a minimum five feet tall fence. My friend's fence was only the regular three foot chain link fence, and the gate had recently been broken by the Nelson's kid. So, as soon as they put the pool up, Mrs. Nelson called the police because the pool violated code and present a drowning danger to her children. Mind you they have a permanent above-ground pool that their kids swim in unsupervised all the time. The officer arrives and tells us we either need a taller fence or to get rid of the pool. Here's where the MC comes in. The code states that the fence just needs to be 5 feet tall, not contiguous, made of the same material, or good-looking. So, me and my brother went around collecting sticks while my friend and his mom went to the fleet farm to buy chicken wire and zip ties. We then spent the next hour zip tying the sticks to the fence and the chicken wire to the sticks as well as zipping the gate closed. Mrs. Nelson is of course disgusted by this affront to her beautiful neighborhood, and calls the village again the next day. The same officer is sent out as the day before and lets the angry lady know that the fence is up to code and that she should stop waste info office's time with non-issues. This was not the first or last issue with her and her family, even in terms of malicious compliance, but this one is pretty funny and almost perfectly encapsulates my experience growing up in almost rural middle America. Thank you for listening.